Hello, welcome members. See folks kind of rolling in. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and for all your continued support. We'll just wait a few more moments until folks get into the Zoom room. If you wanna put in the chat where you're tuning in from, that's always awesome to see where our members are coming from, all of our local and digital members. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jess Nixon and I am a part of the membership team at the Academy. Uh, today, we are very excited to Welcome Dr. Lauren Esposito, the Curator of Arachnology and Co-Director of our Islands 2030 Initiative. Uh, we will be sharing their work related to the new initiative and take you through the latest expedition. So please use the chat throughout the program um, or the Q&A function to ask any questions you might have, and we will answer them at the end. So without further ado, I think I'm going to hand it off to Lauren. Thank you so much, Jess. All right, so today I'm super excited to talk to you about a new initiative that uh, we've started here at the Academy. And, and I'm also extra excited to talk about it because it's the first time I've ever talked to anybody who is an Academy staff about this initiative. Um, the initiative is, is Islands 2030. Uh, and I'm the co-director of the initiative along with Dr. Raina Bell, who's our curator of herpetology. Um, who's actually on a tropical island uh, as we speak. She's on the island of Puerto Rico doing, doing some, some field work and research about frogs. Um, but I wanna share with you what the Islands 2030 initiative is uh, and, and in particular, why we are so excited about, about tackling this, this, I think really big and complex issue here at the Academy. So the Islands 2030 initiative is a new paradigm it's a paradigm for reversing biodiversity loss to ensure a regenerative future for humans and nature that can be scaled to Earth's larger ecosystems. We've identified five archipelagos around the world where we're going to be focusing this effort. And we've identified these archipelagos because each of them is a site of long-standing academy research and expeditions with really strong existing partnerships that academy scientists like myself and Reina, for example, have built our careers and our research programs for, from. And so we selected these on the basis of this longstanding academy research and, and partnerships. And so I, I wanna just introduce you to the five archipelagos. The first is the Galapagos. Um, the Galapagos is, is a place that the academy has been going in terms of scientific expeditions for over a hundred years. And there we have really close par partnerships and ties with the Charles Darwin Research Center and the Galapagos National Park, uh, among many other uh, local NGOs. Over in the Caribbean Ocean, we're gonna be working in the Lesser Antilles, which is a volcanic chain uh, in the Eastern Caribbean Sea. Um, and there we'll be partnering with organizations like the University of the West Indies and the Caribbean Netherlands Science Institute. Over in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, off the west coast of, Af of Central Africa, uh, we'll be working with the Gulf of Guinea Biodiversity Center, which is a brand new um, NGO just started uh, during, during the period of COVID uh, and led in part by some longstanding academy scientists and educators. Uh, and we'll also be working with a, an NGO that's pretty active there called BirdLife International that's focused on bird diversity. On the other side of Africa, we'll be working in Madagascar and the Mascarenes, and in, including but not limited to partnering with our own Madagascar Biodiversity Center, um, which is in, in Antananarivo, where we have not only a field station, um, but we're also building a new um, facility for, for, for harvesting insect protein. Uh, to help tackle the, the, the crisis of, 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 of starvation in Southern Madagascar. Um, we'll also be working with the University of Antananarivo where we have many close colleagues and, and partners. And finally, but, but not certainly not least, over in Southeast Asia, we'll be working in the Philippines and particularly focusing on the Southern Philippines 
um, and working with the National Museum of the Philippines and the University of Mindanao, which is located in, in the Southern Philippines. So if you're wondering first why we as the California Academy of Sciences should be caring about islands or whether why anybody really should be caring about islands. Well, islands harbor the greatest concentration of biodiversity on our planet. They're also epicenters of extinction. So while there's proportionally more biodiversity on islands, there's more, also more extinctions on islands. For example, 75% of all recent extinctions of terrestrial animals, so land-based animals, have occurred on islands, and 85% of the remaining reptile, amphibian, and mammal species on islands today are highly threatened, along with nearly half of all bird species endemic to islands. So islands are under threat. And so the Academy is going to be working on these islands and, and, and we, we have some longstanding history. For example, Academy expeditions to island archipelagos have been at the heart of our institution for over a hundred years. Our Madagascar and Galapagos collections are among the largest and most valuable in the world. And they've already been used to extensively solidify humanity's understanding of evolution and inspire the public here in our very own building with stories of unique island diversity. For example, this photograph is a photograph of our 19, early 1900s expeditions to the Galapagos that returned with a ship belly full of specimens, the largest scientific expedition in the history of the Galapagos that rebuilt our own institution after our, our entire collection was lost in the 1906 earthquake and fire. But the collections, that we have and their associated data are not fully cataloged even today, nor are they available to either the scientific community or the general public. So through the Islands Initiative, one of the things, one of our aims is to unlock the power of scientific collections. We're going to be developing a fully open access collections portal to democratize the access to biodiversity data. And we aim to digitize over 1 million new records of land-based biodiversity from the Academy's collection, spanning the five focal archipelagos that I mentioned and using new technologies like conveyor belt imaging systems and machine learning that will read old handwritten labels. We're gonna begin with the Galapagos collection this year and these data will be used to generate maps of species distributions and richness and the specimens themselves will become a source of DNA for genetic analysis throughout the entire initiative. The, the biodiversity maps that we generate will also help to inform high priority areas to target during our field expeditions, another important component of the islands initiative. So the thing that we need to remember about islands is that because islands are these relatively simple ecosystems, nearly all islands are at risk of catastrophic cascades of further species extinction. But because of their simplicity, we can even stop, we can stop and even reverse the biodiversity crisis that's, that we're seeing on islands, creating a new pathway for regenerating ecosystems at scale. So one of the things that we aim to do in the islands initiative is really demonstrate how we can reverse and regenerate ecosystems um, because of the simplicity of islands. We're given an, a unique opportunity to do this at scale. And I just wanna give you an example of what that looks like. So here's, here's an illustration of how a targeted intervention can have really dramatic impacts on island ecosystems. This is the island of Choros, where, where um, a, 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 a removal uh, project was undertaken by the organization Island Conservation, which is an NGO based right here in the Bay Area uh, across the Bay in Berkeley. And invasive mammals from islands are one of the biggest threats to most island ecosystems around the world. So for example, these images show the landscape change in just three years before and after the removal of invasive rabbits from, from Choros Island off the coast of Chile. And it really highlights the fragility of island ecosystems. Um, that's one of the things that we're so excited about with our collection and that we feel is really, really important to digitizing our specimens um, because we can use these specimens to create baselines for what biodiversity looked like before the introduction of mammals in many cases so that we can really try to reverse the change or regenerate these ecosystems from the ground up. Another one of our big initiatives within the, within the islands initiative is to how do we really amplify the value of biodiversity? 
Uh, we're going to be working on K to 12 student and teacher engagement, and we're going to be lo working locally with with our with locally based conservation coordinators who will be a part of the initiative to amplify the value of biodiversity across the entire community. We're going to bring together partners from the economic and conservation sectors to devise plans for meeting the UN's 2030 goals for sustainable development. And in particular, what we're gonna be focusing on are goals identified by the UN Small Island Developing States Group. This is a special group uh, within the UN that is island nations, uh, and in particular, tropical island nations and the tropical island nations we're gonna be working with through this initiative. So we're gonna be engaging the public at large through using targeted social media campaigns that celebrate local biodiversity on the islands where these people are based. And we're also gonna be creating public spaces for informal convenings around biodiversity. For example, here you can see, if it loads, uh, here you can see some biodiversity posters that we produced, that the Academy produced 10 years ago that, in, that are still hanging in public spaces in the Gulf of Guinea. And there's clearly a demand and enthusiasm for information about organisms that are only found on the islands, that are found nowhere else in the world by the local communities uh, who are the stewards of these ecosystems. Currently, Dr. Raina Bell is collaborating with a team of local partners in the Gulf of Guinea uh, on the island of Sao Tome to install a biodiversity themed playground downtown that we really envision as a natural venue for future organized convenings, for pop-up exhibits, and as an informal gathering space for community-led events centered around biodiversity. This playground should be completed by this coming summer, and we plan to host our first convening for the Gulf of Guinea in year two of the initiative. I also wanted to mention one of the cornerstones of this initiative, our STEM leadership cohort. So through the Islands 2030 initiative, we're going to be creating a global cohort of graduate students and postdocs who will be trained right here at the Academy in cutting edge biodiversity science, where they'll be gaining the skills and support needed to become a network, a global network of conservation and science leaders in their respective countries. These teams of early career researchers and their Academy mentors will lead expeditions within the island archipelagos that they're from, and they'll learn new methods, including genetics in our Center for Comparative Genomics here at the Cal Academy, analytical skills on our in-house computing clusters, and the use of tools for digital specimen, specimen imaging, really ultimately going on to become the world's experts on tropical island plants and animals. Our first cohort of nearly 25 graduate students will be recruited this year, hopefully by, by the end of next month, and at, by the time that this cohort leaves the academy in a few years with a master's or a PhD, these students will not only be our collaborators, but they will also have their own network of colleagues who are working on islands around the world to solve similar island biodiversity challenges in the first half of this century. Really, given the inevitability of continued global change, we believe that to stop that we need to stop investing in attempts to preserve ecosystems as they are today. And instead, we need to predict and plan for the needs of ecosystems in the future. Through this initiative, our students and researchers, this cornerstone of the future of island biodiversity science, will be building a new pathway for informed conservation, where we'll be forecasting threats and empowering solutions, looking towards the future. To accomplish this, we're gonna be using the genetics, that DNA coming from our own uh, collections that I mentioned earlier, to understand the past evolutionary histories of plants and animals on islands. But we'll combine that information with information about current land use and climate change that's projected in the future to predict the future needs of island ecosystems. Then in partnership with local scientists, the scientists that we're training and others, and local governments, we're going to be using this information to create island by island models of priorities for conservation or for regeneration. Our rich historic collections and ongoing scientific collaborations really allow us to hit the ground running for this initiative. And that's really why we chose to focus the initiative on islands where we're already working and have a past history, uh, not only of scientific research, but partnerships, because we need to hit the ground running if we're going to accomplish these goals by the year 2030. Another huge element of this initiative is the K-12 student and teacher engagement program uh, in which we'll collaborate with counterparts, education counterparts on each archipelago 
to engage the entire island community in place-based learning and to foster environmental stewardship. For 10 years, the Academy has been leading a biodiversity education program in the Gulf of Guinea Islands. And this program has led to increased appreciation of local biodiversity among all island residents. For example, a major outcome of our research is that the new currency design for the country features their native species, including this Academy photograph of a giant tree frog that's shown right here on the 20 Dobro note, which I think really demonstrates that the biodiversity stories that we're sharing within the classroom are reaching the community far beyond the classroom. In the Islands Initiative, we plan to build from our prior success and introduce the concept of regeneration alongside existing educational assets that feature local biodiversity. These updated curricula will be paired with professional development for educators, bringing the Academy's special brand of environmental learning to island communities all around the world. We're gonna be piloting this, this content uh, this year, starting in the Gulf of Guinea, where we already have strong partnerships with educators, and we're gonna be expanding our efforts into other archipelagos, for example, the Galapagos in years two and three of the program. So what does this look like in the end of the day? We have, we've identified a number of outcomes that, that we think fall into three different pathways for the initiative. And these pathways are also pathways across our entire new uh, institutional strategy. The first is biodiversity science. We envision that by the year 2030 on these five tropical archipelagos, there'll be increased knowledge of biodiversity on focal islands. And that's because oftentimes when students receive curriculum in schools, that curriculum is, spoke, is coming from places like Europe, where the plants and animals that are being discussed in the textbooks have little to nothing to do with the local plants and animals that these students experience in their day-to-day -day lives. We also think that we'll, that we'll be able to increase the knowledge of local biodiversity in terms of our scientific research. Uh, and that's because we'll be launching these major expeditions to go and thoroughly document the plants and animals living on these islands today but also digitization of our collections here at the Academy to build a baseline of what was there in some cases over a hundred years ago. We're gonna be doing genomic assessments of the evolutionary history, but also the current vulnerability of island species. We'll be looking at the populations today and how genetically healthy and robust those populations are so that we can determine whether or not some of them may need interventions in order to prevent extinction. And finally, we're gonna be building these island by island models of conservation priorities. We wanna equip the local governments and decision makers with tools that will allow them to decide which of these communities are fragile and on the verge of collapse versus which of these plant and animal communities are relatively robust and healthy so that they can focus their attention and limited resources where it's needed today, but also to plan for the future of a healthy ecosystem on each of these islands. Along our environmental learning pathway, We'll be bringing this global cohort of biodiversity science and conservation leaders to the academy to receive training, but also to build relationships and partnerships that will last them a lifetime and throughout their careers. We want to provide equitable access to environmental learning materials and resources for K-12 students and educators on each of these islands. So we'll be, we'll be co-creating some of these materials, but also deploying a uh, training to these educators so that they have the, 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 the means to, through which they can, they can um, teach the students about their local flora and fauna and the importance of conserving biodiversity. And we hope that this will lead to increased advocacy for protecting island biodiversity throughout the community at, at any age, really. And finally, within our collaborative engagement pathway, we're going to be piloting these community-based conservation concepts for tropical islands. Communities, we hope, will move towards biodiversity-centered green economies by the year 2030. We really want to see these islands self-sustainable and self-sustainable in a way that's regenerative, that focuses on biodiversity and centers bio biodiversity and their plans for their future economic growth. And finally, we wanna see these islands adopting regenerative approaches to conservation. We think and we really believe that regeneration as a conservation approach uh, is one that's not only more sustainable, but, but increases health both in human communities as well as, as the plant and animal communities living on islands and beyond. In terms of impacts, collectively, the impacts of the island initiative will be that the ecological health of tropical islands, these five archipelagos, has shifted from degenerating to regenerating. 
that island communities will have embraced biodiversity as a path towards achieving sustainable development. And this isn't something that we're inventing. This is actually part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular, the goals that this UN Small Island Developing States has identified for themselves. And finally, we want a new deeply collaborative community-based conservation strategy being widely implemented across the islands to halt the biodiversity loss that these islands are, are experiencing at a rate higher than their continental counterparts like here in North America or, or even in adjacent areas like Central or South America or Africa. But the impacts of the Islands Initiative will extend beyond the islands themselves. And that's because the Islands Initiative is also a proof of concept. It's a proof of concept of a new and necessary pathway for conservation in which we actively predict and plan for what's needed for a future where biodiversity and humans thrive together. Because of the relative simplicity of island ecosystems, we can fine tune and tailor our approach to regenerative conservation with the aim of scaling the lessons learned on these islands to larger and more complex ecosystems like those here in California. And so islands represent the legacy of the California Academy of Sciences. They're in our history, they're in our DNA. They were, they were how we built back our institution but they're also our pathway here in California and around the world to a more resilient future. So I just wanted to share with you uh, an update from the Islands Initiative. We, we really just got off the ground. The Islands Initiative is a brand new initiative here at the California Academy of Sciences. But as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to hit the ground running. So our inaugural expedition for the Islands 2030 Initiative was just this past October with a two week trip to the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean. We visited two islands, the islands of Ceiba and the island of St. Martin. These are two really different islands that are, that are next door neighbors to one another. The island of, of Ceiba, in part because of its geology, is this steep island erupting out of the ocean uh, that was, that's a part of a, of a still uh, technically active, though dormant, volcano. Um, and Ceiba is not a very developed island. Uh, in fact, they really, pride themselves on, on being what they call, the, I guess the, the slogan of the island is the unspoiled queen, on really focusing on their biodiversity and centering their biodiversity as a resource for their economy, in particular tourism. Conversely, the island of St. Martin is extremely degraded. It's very developed. And the, tour, the, the brand of tourism that St. Martin specializes in is really um, high density tourism. For example, you can see these really large cruise ships docked at a port simultaneously. So the island's been pretty degraded. And in fact, most of the ecosystems are degraded. And one of the things that we wanted to do is explore these two islands, both in terms of mapping the, the present day biodiversity of the islands, but also getting a sense of, of what partners on the ground are doing right now to try to prevent further biodiversity loss in these two places. So we visited and we really had the, the, all three of our pathways of our strategic pathways in mind. We focused on biodiversity science. So we were going out um, sampling plants and animals for genetic tissues and documenting what lives where on each of these islands across all the ecosystems on the island. Um, we were focusing on environmental learning. We had the opportunity to, to, to participate in an annual event that occurs on the island of Ceiba called Ceiba See and Learn, where they bring scientists to the community uh, to visit the schools, to give public lectures, and to engage in their own research if they want to. And finally, we worked on some collaborative engagement projects. We, ha we ha held meetings with, with all of the, the key players in these two islands in the sphere of biodiversity learning and, and, and research. Um, so we met with all of the agencies involved in that uh, on each of the two islands. For example, one of the people that we got, we had an opportunity to go out into the field with is Tadzio Borvots, who's the director of the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance. And the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance is the agency that manages all of the parks in the Dutch Caribbean. And I just wanted to share with you this little clip that was caught sort of in an informal moment as we were out hiking um, with a community group in the island of Seba one, one night. Maybe it would be super great if like some of these guys, like these, these guys here, <laughs> learn to catch the snakes and people could just WhatsApp them and yeah. they could come over and get the snakes out of their house so that they don't kill them. 
I can make it. Yeah. I, li I like them both. So uh, let's do it. I like the hitless idea too. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Yeah. So this was just us talking informally. Um, we we had an idea based on on uh, an outreach event that we did actually at the senior center. Um, Dr. Raina Bell and I went to the senior center and presented to them about the the arachnid species and the and the reptile and and amphibian species living on the island of Seba, um, and why we were so excited to be there documenting these. And one of the reactions from one of the seniors was something that prompted this informal conversation with Tadzio and and what they remarked on was that. This woman uh, remarked that she sees snakes all the time. And in particular, what she was talking about is a species of racer, which I'll mention again in just a moment, which has been extirpated from two of the four islands in the Caribbean that it once existed on. And what she said to us was, even after hearing our entire presentation and how much we care about these animals was that every time she sees a snake, she kills it. And that she doesn't care what we say about snakes and, and how they're not dangerous, that she hates those snakes and she kills every single one that she sees. And so we started having this conversation with Tadzio that was kind of inspired by the youth from the island about how we could create a Save Our Snakes um, sort of task force among the youth, where these youth that were really excited and not scared about snakes, but very enthusiastic about seeing them and catching them could, could go out to people's homes because it's again, it's a really small island. The population is only about a thousand people and they could go out to people's homes and catch the snakes and move them up into the, the more natural areas in the forest um, rather than these, these snakes, which are endangered. They're actually critically endangered um, being killed. And so Tadzio thought that was a great idea uh, and, and was, was really excited to, to deploy it. And, and because of the size of these islands, an idea like this can be deployed in a really short amount of time and with not a lot of oversight or, or, or necessary um, precautions. Because here we were talking to the director of all of the national parks um, in the Dutch Antilles and the Netherlands Antilles, uh, who was ready to, to, to deploy this, this operation, Save Our Snakes with the youth of the island. So that was pretty exciting. We also met with all sorts of folks. We met with uh, Lynn Costarno, who's, who's the person that, that created Seba Sea and Learn, this program to get scientists to um, her small island of Seba and really increase the scientific education opportunities for, for not only the young people on the island through the schools, but, but really the entire community. We met with Kai Wolf, who's the parks manager at Seba Conservation Foundation, and Dahlia Hassel, who's the projects officer for the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance based in Seba. Uh, and we, we had similar meetings in St. Martin, meeting with both the French and the Dutch sides who are responsible for, for um, overseeing the parks. In fact, there's no terrestrial um, park or land-based national park in the island of St. Martin on the Dutch side. And on the French side, the only uh, protected land is just along the coast adjacent to the, to the marine reserve. Um, so there's still quite a bit of work to be done to reach the goal of conserving 30% of, of land by the year 2030. Uh, on these islands. We also visited the classrooms, as I mentioned, of every single child on the island of Seba. And again, because it's a relatively small island, this is something that's really feasible even in just a week time on the island. Um, so we've met every single child between the ages of five and nine. We met with seniors at the community center and we led a night hike for 40 people from the community. And finally, we also gave an outdoor live stream presentation from a cloud forest up at the top of the island. Um, that was attended by, by about 100 people from the community. And I just wanted to share with you this clip. This is uh, Drs. Uh, Raina Bell and Wen, um, who, are, who are both herpetologists who, who work in the Caribbean. Uh, Raina's our, our curator of herpetology, as I mentioned earlier. And this is just one of the classes uh, that they're doing a little show and tell from some of the organisms that, that we had found on the island earlier in the week. And this was Raina just showing these, these students frogs up and close for the first time. And they've probably heard the frogs. The frogs are hard to miss. They're pretty loud. Um, but many of the students just, just hadn't explored exactly what these frogs look like. Um, and we're probably surprised to learn that, that outside of the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean, you can't find these frogs anywhere else in the world. Uh, and, and I think that that's something that, that's, that's really leaves 
leaves local people no matter where you are in the world with a big impression that you cannot find these organisms anywhere else in the world and that it's your responsibility to ensure that they're around for the next generation and, and the generation beyond that. We also did a ton of biodiversity science. And so we visited every ecosystem and each of these islands has both a wet side uh, and a dry side as a consequence of, of a rain shadow created by, by the mountains right in the middle of the islands. And so we visited each of these ecosystems around the island and did thorough surveys of the, of the, the uh, reptiles and amphibians as well as the arachnids on the island. Um, and one of the reasons that we, were, that we wanted to make sure that we got each of the ecosystems was because there's different things found in each of those ecosystems. And even some of the same animals um, that are found in both ecosystems can be really dramatically different. And so one of the things that, um, that we were looking at was the effects of um, the wet and the dry side on coloration and what that coloration means in terms of predation. So uh, to get at that question, to see whether the, the different colors that we observe of lizards on the dry side and the wet side, this is the same species of lizard, is affected by trying to escape predation. So like being more invisible to your predators, we set up a little, a little camera trap experiment. Um, and so uh, Mike, Dr. Mike Wen uh, created these clay models of anolis lizards, these lizards that are only found on these islands. Um, and he created brown ones that are, respect, that are more similar to the, the color of the, the, the anolis lizards on the dry side and green ones that are more similar to the color in, in the tropical forest and the wet side. And then we put them out with, with, uh, on one tree and across from, from that tree, we would, we would strap a camera trap that's a motion trigger activated camera. Um, and we set those camera traps out for the whole week to see whether there was more predation attempts on, on, on either the brown or the green, uh, given the environment that they were in. Uh, and so we did that again on both islands to see if there was an effect on either of those islands. And this is, was a preliminary test of this concept um, that we hope to deploy at, at greater extent across the entire archipelago in the future. There's that video of a, 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 a slow motion capture of the production that we were doing while we were there of these clay models. And we, so we also collected a new spider species in Seba and probably what's well, probably a new scorpion species. And so here's just a little clip of the spiders and scorpions in my hand. Um, the scorpion we already knew about, although currently it's recognized as a subspecies, um, so just a geographic variant of a species. But the reality is, is that it's probably a, a species that, that, that deserves its own, its own recognition as a fully unique species. And we also documented a robust population of the endangered red belly racer, uh, this snake that, that lives on Seba, which is really good news because it's already been extirpated from two of the four islands. Here's a clip of Dr. Sarah Cruz, who's an arachnology researcher here at the academy, um, who caught one of these racers. Uh, and, and we were able to bring this racer to the school for show and tell with the students to help socialize the students to this really completely harmless snake that many of the island residents are fearful of. And here's, here's a little, little clip of Sarah examining her, her catch. Uh, and I will happily report that the racer was safely released um, back exactly where we found it uh, a day later, unharmed, um, although definitely oogled by many school children. And finally, one of the outcomes of this, of this uh, biodiversity science research was that we documented a gecko lid. This, this species of really tiny little geckos. You can see um, Reina's fingers up in the corner of this, this picture, just quite how tiny these little geckolets are. Um, and this geckolet was previously unknown from the island, which significantly expands, this discovery of it on Seba significantly expands its known range and the conservation potential of this island. Because again, Seba has these really healthy, robust ecosystems in really stark contrast to the islands surrounding it, the island of St. Martin, and the islands of St. Kitts and Nevis, which have really significantly degraded habitat. So just to summarize, in terms of our early wins, we met with three potential partner foundations on these two islands. We were only there for two weeks um, and we met with all the, all the managers managing the, the wildlife um, on two islands and two different nations. There's both French aspects and uh, Netherlands Antilles aspects to each island. Well, Seba's entirely Dutch, but uh, the other one is split right down the middle. We also visited the classrooms of every single child on the island of Seba between the ages of five and nine. 
We met with the seniors at the community at the senior community center. We led a night hike for 40 people from the community and we gave this outdoor live stream presentation directly from a cloud forest on the island of Seba, all as part of this really incredible program, Seba See and Learn, that we hope will be a model um, that, that can be implemented on other similar islands focused on biodiversity and bringing science to the islands. We also did a ton of biodiversity science. And the really early findings are we found a new scorpion species, a new spider species. We documented this gecko lit that really significantly expands its known range. Um, and we also documented a robust population of the endangered red belly racer on Sabo, which is really great news again, because it's been extirpated from two of the four islands it once existed on. And the other of the two where it's still remaining has a pretty, pretty small population. And so, I just wanna say that this was an incredible two weeks for us. We, we were a team, a small team of four researchers uh, and, a, and a partner from our digital engagement team, Laurel Allen, who came along to document our trip. And we, we were really spent most of our time meeting with partners, listening to and learning from these island communities. When we were tasked by our executive director over a year ago to dream big and thinking of these initiatives, we really aimed for the sky. And what we've learned on this trip was that our dream of halting biodiversity loss on islands by the year 2030 is not only tangible, but with the help of the whole academy and all of the incredible diverse skill sets of the people that work here, this is a dream that's really firmly within our grasp. And so I just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in and listening to uh, my stories about not only what inspires me for the future of biodiversity um, on islands, but, but in particular, uh, this initial expedition that was just two weeks and really accomplished more than I ever could have hoped for, including quite a lot of COVID testing. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Please, please just drop them into the into the chat. Or I think Jess is here to to help moderate that. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much, Lauren. It was so amazing to hear about this initiative and see all those beautiful images and videos. So we do have a couple questions for you. Um, first question from Laura. Are there volunteer opportunities to work on the 2030 Island Initiative? So I do think that there'll be lots of volunteer opportunities. And one of the things that we're doing um, in our current stage of the initiative development is we've just, we've just formulated our initiative team. So this is all of the folks from across the academy, um, like basically every department of the academy who are gonna be participating because we really view this as like, it, it takes a village to, to, to help save biodiversity on island situation. Um, and so, as part of that, we'll, we're going to be figuring out exactly all of the elements and how they all fit together. Uh, and that includes things like our members, how members can contribute to islands and island and the island initiative, but also volunteers. And so, so stay tuned. There's gonna be so much more information coming out about not only the islands initiative, but the new California initiative and our Hope for Reefs 2 initiative that, that, that are, are just, just underway. Awesome. Looks like we have another question from Jim, uh, do researchers have to take samples back to CAS or is it just digital records? It really depends on the group. So for many groups, for example, um, birds uh, and, and many terrestrial vertebrates, so birds and mammals primarily, we have a pretty good understanding of what diversity is on islands. And we also have pretty significant holdings and collections already that we can turn to for DNA, um, for genetic samples and genetic sources. In other cases, for example, um, I'll take the case of arachnids because that's what I'm most familiar with as an arachnid researcher. Um, the tropical islands that we go to on average, only about the 30 to 40% of the things that we collect have been documented by science, which means that 70% of the, of the smaller things, especially small arthropods like small insects and arachnids are completely new to science. And so how do we then establish a baseline if we don't know what's there to start with? So in many of those cases, it's absolutely necessary that we take samples back to the Cal Academy, but also that we develop reference libraries for our partner organizations that are there locally. So it's important that there is a local reference collection in the Galapagos and in the Philippines and in the Gulf of Guinea that people can turn to um, experts that are based there, but also the local communities to understand uh, and interpret the plants and animals that are living there and, and also to establish this baseline um, and I think like the best proxy I can give for that is the way that we know earthquakes are coming, like our earthquake prediction systems, which are not always super, super robust, but, but better than nothing, are based on long-term baseline data, a long-term understanding of what 
the seismic activity occurs on Earth without an earthquake. And so that way we can forecast these earthquakes coming. And this, I would say that we need to establish something similar for biodiversity. We need a baseline so that we can understand when things start to fall apart, when new species that could be invasive get introduced, when ecosystems turn from being at risk to being under risk um, and really at, at risk of this catastrophic collapse of ecosystems that, that we're most fearful of, particularly in these really simple ecosystems. Great. I think we have one more question. Um, someone is interested in what the next expedition is that is planned. Well, that's a great question. So um, that's it's under debate a little bit at the moment, but um, one I think that that we're probably going to be going to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, where there's some existing work already going on in the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, where we're looking for. Uh, in some endangered species of reptiles and trying to document what's still existing there today in terms of the population. And so again, like with islands, one of the main things that we're really trying to do is to leverage the ongoing work of the academy and scale it up. So this is an opportunity to join an existing expedition, but really scale it to, to look at a, a snapshot in time of the entire ecosystem and not just the, the health of the reptile population. So again, help us build this baseline. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Lauren. It was so great to hear about this initiative. Oh, actually, we might have one more question dropping in the chat. Are educational programs funded by grants or local governments? Um, so, so through the Islands Initiative, we're, we're exploring all the potential sources of, of funding. And some of that is funds that are earmarked by like big international organizations like the Inter International Monetary Fund. Um, you know, because of the UN sustainable development goals, there, there are funds earmarked, particularly for developing countries to help them build a sustainable economy. And, and that includes aspects of education, it includes workforce development. And so those are things that we're exploring. We're also exploring private foundation funding. Um, and so I think that, there, there, that, that the answer to that question is I don't know yet, but we're exploring everything. And we have a fantastic department here at the Academy who is experts in trying to figure out how to fund things like this initiative that we really care about. Wonderful. Well, thanks again, Lauren. It was so nice to hear from you. And thank you members for tuning in. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Have a great rest of your day.